Appearing on the Ideas stage today, Governor Spencer Cox, Mira Moravi, Pfizer's Amir Malik, and Southern Company's Chris Womack, Russell Moore, and Hillary Rodham Clinton. And now, please welcome The Atlantic's Alice McCown. Good morning. All right. I'm Alice McCown, publisher and chief revenue officer at The Atlantic, and I'm so excited to welcome you to the final day of The Atlantic Festival. This November marks the 166th year since the first issue of The Atlantic was published. When the founders launched the magazine, The Atlantic Monthly, their goal was to publish the most urgent essays and vital literature while pursuing truth and disrupting consensus, regardless of party or clique. That goal continues to serve as a driving force of the magazine, and for 15 years now, the same can be said of the Atlantic Festival. This morning, we'll explore the necessity of bridging public political divides, the future of AI, the crisis facing America's evangelical church, and ongoing threats to democracy. These conversations are sure to be as engaging as they are thought-provoking, and we thank everyone who's here in person and tuning in virtually for joining us today. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the underwriters for supporting the Atlantic's journalism today. Our presenting underwriters, Leaps by Bear, Pfizer, Southern Company, our supporting underwriter, Allstate, and our contributing underwriters, AHIP, Barber, Boston Consulting Group, City of Hope, Eli Lilly and Company, Genentech, Goldman Sachs, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and Visit Seattle. Thank you again for joining us today and enjoy the show. Here to discuss shifting the political discourse, please welcome Utah Governor Spencer Cox with McKay Coppins, a staff writer at The Atlantic. Governor Cox, thank you for joining us bright and early. It's great to be here. What, a, what an opportunity. Thanks for having me, McKay. So I want to frame our conversation by reading you uh, some findings from Pew, a big survey they did last year, that I think capture the depth of the problem that you're trying to address. So um, Pew surveyed thousands of people last year, found that 63% of Democrats view Republicans as immoral, and 72% of Republicans feel the same way about Democrats. <laughs> Further, 72% of Republicans call Democrats dishonest, 83% of Democrats call Republicans closed-minded. So what, what that says to me is that we're at a point in this country where significant majorities of people on both sides uh, don't just disagree with each other, they see the other side as fundamentally bad people whose views are invalid, right? Um, now, before we get to the potential solutions and, and kind of the initiative that you have, I, I'm curious how you've seen that th those conditions manifest in your own state, in your own life as a political leader. How, what is the trickle down uh, effect of the, that, that, those, the, that, that political culture that we're talking about? Well, I, I think we've all seen it, and uh, and sadly, this polarization is is increasing. And th there's a great um, j just before that Pew data came out, um, Rachel Kleinfeld with with, with Carnegie. Um, her, her research around polarization, I think is fascinating. I encourage everybody to read her report, it came out earlier this month. Uh, and, and the focus is on what happens when we get so extremely polarized. What we're seeing on, on the ground is, and her focus is on political violence and, and a significant increase in political violence. So threats against member of, members of Congress um, over the past six or seven years have increased tenfold. Um, so again, threats of political violence increased tenfold. Against the judiciary, it's, it's doubled. And, and that's kind of the extreme of what happens when we, we drain all the trust out of the system. Now, she's also studied uh, failing democracies, uh, republics like ours, uh, across the world and across time. 
And uh, she will tell you and, and says in this report that, that we, we, are, we are passing all of these checkpoints. Mm -hmm. So I, look. I mean, you, you tweeted yes, or last week, uh, I believe there is a very real chance of a complete failure of our democratic institutions in our republic. So yes. just, just so the yeah. group here understands how seriously you take it. Yeah, no, uh, you think this is funny? No, I, um, <laughs> seriously, though, I, like, I, I'm, I'm not prone to hyperbole. Um, I'm, I'm usually the person who is very cynical and dismisses you know, all of that. Sadly, um, politicians, one of the things that, uh, that I think is, is different today is that, that politicians have figured out how to use fear to divide us. So, so, so some of that d data coming from Pew, wh why is it we think that? And, and why is that so dangerous? And I'll say that in, in just a second, but, um, but, but I, I, tr I truly believe that we're, we're living through kind of an 1850s experience in our country again. And, and as, you, as you drain the trust from the system, as, as Jonathan Haidt said, uh, you, you end up with, with not just failure of democratic institutions, but the end result of that is not just us hating each other in a, in a, in a pluralistic society, but, but it, it ends with people shooting each other. And, and, and that should scare all of us. And it should scare all of us into doing whatever we can to, to stop that, uh, to, to kind of re-engage each other in positive ways. Um, but, but here's the point to all of this. Um, that is, it's not what Republicans and Democrats believe. It's what Republicans think Democrats believe and what Democrats think Republicans believe. It's called the perception gap. And, and we've all heard about it. It's very well documented. It, it exists. Um, it turns out that most Republicans and most Democrats aren't that far apart um, philosophically. Uh, we, 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 just, we just aren't. But we, we think we are. And that's dangerous because if you think that the other side is willing to violate democratic norms, if you think the other side is willing to engage in political violence, if you think the other side is willing to do all of these crazy things, then, then it, it, you give permission to your side to do the same things. That's what's dangerous, because we start trying to one-up each other. Well, you know, if Democrats hate the Constitution or trying to destroy this country, then I guess we have to do that too. And if, if, if Republicans are trying to destroy the country and, and you know, January 6th, then I guess we have, to, we have to do that type of stuff too. And, and, and my question is always, where does it end? Where is the line? That, that Overton window just keeps moving, and we become numb to it. So we, we hear the latest thing. And, and again, I, I will say that every Republican thinks <clears throat> all the Democrats are like AOC. And, <laughs> and, and all the Democrats think that we're all Marjorie Taylor Greene. That's, that's, what, that's what you all think. And, and it's, it's not true, and we know it's not true. But, but again, all of the systems, social media, cable news, uh, what do they do? They reward the loudest voices and the, and the most extreme voices. And, and that makes us think that everybody's like the extreme voices. So you and other governors have developed this initiative that you think is, you're hoping will address this problem. You call it Disagree Better. Um, tell us, it's interesting because I think it's slightly different from some of the you know, talking points we've heard in the past about we just need greater civility and we need to be nicer to each other. You, you, it, it's, it's a little different from that. So t tell us what you, this initiative is and, and how you think it'll work. Sure, so uh, as chair this year of the National Governors Association, bipartisan organization, 50 governors, Republicans and Democrats, we always have a Republican chair, a Democrat vice chair, and we switch every other year. So Governor Polis uh, of Colorado, my neighbor, is, is the vice chair this year, and, uh, and we, is, just looking at the landscape, you know, I was going to choose something like education or healthcare policy, like governors have done in the past. We always have an initiative, and I just realized like we can't solve any of these big problems in our country if we hate each other, if we can't talk with each other. I mean, just look at Congress this week, right? We can't, we can't even keep the government open. How can we solve immigration or healthcare? Um, so, uh, so decided that this would. Be, be our thing, that we would work on disagreeing better. Um, and, and immediately your thoughts go someplace. And usually it's like, oh great, another civility initiative, telling <laughs> us to be nice to each other. Um, it, it is, it is uh, and by the way, I, we should be more civil and nicer to each other. Uh, this is not that, okay? Let me be very clear, this is not that. This is, um, this is truly about disagreeing. Uh, and, and I believe that disagreement is, is critical. I, I, I think our, our nation was founded on profound disagreement. Um, our, our Constitution came together with people who profoundly disagreed. 
but it's, it's about disagreeing in healthy ways and, uh, and instead of the toxic ways that we're learning about today. And, and we have a history replete with, with figuring these things out, how to disagree without hating each other, how to disagree without shooting each other, um, how to disagree in productive ways that actually, actually lend themselves to better policy. Um, sadly, we've gotten away from that. And so we, th this is also not just uh, Governor Cox's whim. Uh, it, it's, we're using real research and data from, from some of the greatest institutions in our country, from uh, Stanford and Dartmouth and Duke, their policy labs, um, and, 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 and really the, the work they're doing, uh, the behavioral science work they're doing on how to depolarize a society. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm grateful for my fellow governors that are willing to step into this. One of the things that we learned from some work that was done at Stanford is um, actually an ad I did that I didn't know was submitted to their study, um, but it was, uh, yeah, if you can get, if you can get, so, so just, just quick background, um, 2020 election, we're one of those weird states where our, our gubernatorial election is the same time as the presidential election. So 2020, I'm running for governor um, right in the middle of the, the craziness of, of, of the pandemic and, and, and Biden, Trump, and uh, uh, a friend of mine, we were talking and about the presidential election and she just, you know, I, I said, I'm, I'm worried that if, if Trump wins, the left is gonna burn it down um, because we had just seen the riots in the wake of George Floyd's murder across the country. And I said, and I, I worry if, uh, if, if Biden wins that the right is gonna shoot it up, um, you know, and, and January 6th happened after that. But she said, isn't there anything you can do? So I, I got with my, my Democratic opponent and we decided to film an ad together, never been done before. We, we were on stage, some of you may have seen it, it went viral. Um, I said, I'm, I'm Spencer Cox, a Republican, and I think you should vote for me. He said, I'm Chris Peterson, a Democrat, and I think you should vote for me. Kind of like a quintessentially Utah moment. <laughs> it was like, just like, and, you're, you're and supposed to be running against each other and you're like, hey guys, like, let's, <laughs> It, it, let's just all calm down, you know? And, and that's what it was. And, 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 and the lines were like, and, and while we disagree on a lot of things, um, we both agree that we can disagree without hating each other, that we will accept the results of the election, whatever they are, that we will you know, find ways to work on, on issues together. But um, what's interesting is what Stanford found about this ad. Because yeah, the ad did go viral and people were sharing it as kind of like a wholesome counterpoint to the presidential election. Millions of people. But yeah. what, what did Stanford find about well, so, this ad? So, so, so some professor submitted it to this study that Stanford did, and they, they studied 25 interventions, 30,000 people, and, and they found that it had an effect on depolarizing people and lowering the temperature, especially towards political violence. Thank you. So much to our surprise, it worked, uh, I guess, at least for a short amount of time, uh, it worked. And that's, that's the other thing they found out. And so, so, so my other, I've asked my colleagues to engage in doing this type of work. So Governor Polis and I filmed an ad together around the dinner table about disagreeing better around the dinner table, that your, your MAGA uncle and your woke niece can actually have a conversation. <laughs> Um, and, and, and we can do this. And uh, we just had the, 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 governor, uh, the, the, the governors of Kansas and Missouri, Republican and Democrat, film an ad together. We're, we're getting it edited right now, and we're gonna be doing a lot more of that among other things, but, but it, just trying to offer some counter-programming to what is likely to be the next most divisive election of our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that you, you've been looking at kind of the science of conflict and how we get trapped in it and how we can more productively navigate it. I'm curious, you, we don't have to belabor this too much, but this isn't just an issue that can be solved at the political leader level, right? It has to be uh, solved at an interpersonal level. And I'm curious, what are some surprising findings that you've come across in terms of uh, how how that uh, woke niece and MAGA uncle can get along with each other, you know, or, yeah, at least, yeah. or at least talk about issues in a way that doesn't drive them further apart. Sure. What we found is that a lot of this is counterintuitive, right? And, um, and in fact, it's, it's counterintuitive to politics, but, but it's also kind of counterintuitive to human nature. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, John Adams said that, that at our core, and again, without, without institutions and without, uh, without patience and humility, uh, these virtues that are so missing, that, that we are all the craven political beasts, basically. That's, that's what he said. At our core, we're all this. And so, look, what, what I hear the most often is, um, I, I hear it a little more from the left uh, than, than the right, but from the left I hear, why, why would I engage with those people 
who hate everything about me, um, disagree with who I am as a, as a person, you know, LGBTQ community, why would I engage with those people when they don't give me the respect or dignity of humanity? And, and, and the answer actually is, and the studies are very clear, uh, first of all, it's the only way to get them to, uh, to change hearts and minds and engage in, 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 in their humanity. Um, that instead of, when, when we attack people, we never change their minds, right? We, we just don't, it, it never works. Um, and yet it feels so good to us and it feels good to the people around us, right? <laughs> and, it, and it feels good on social media. We get that dopamine hit and, uh, and it gets eyeballs. And so the media is like, well, I want people to read my story. They're not gonna read it if we just sit up. Not and the talk Atlantic, about but other, other except media the, I Everywhere except the Atlantic. Atlantic. Um, we are of no party or clique. It, it, this, is, this is absolutely these true. These thoughtful people are our readers. And, and I, I'm grateful to be a token conservative <laughs> on the stage. This is wonderful. <laughs> so, I, thank you. <laughs> We, we love a Republican who quotes Atlantic writers back to us. Ah, so that, yeah, that's, yeah, there you that's go. That's we, <laughs> why you were invited. I, I so appreciate that. In all sincerity. Um, uh, but but, but it, it goes against our human nature. But, but when we do it, when we actually engage, um, it, it, it can change. And so, so that's, that's been really fascinating to me. And, and then to see it work. I, I've shared this before, but um, the, the LGBT, LGBTQ, uh, sorry, I get the initials wrong sometimes. Please forgive me. Um, uh, uh, group in Utah, uh, a, a wonderful human being, Troy Williams, who, who runs that institution, um, it, it, instead of kind of taking the traditional advocacy uh, space, which, which he's done in the past, which is somebody says something, tear them down, uh, fundraise off of it, try to cancel them. Um, he, he, he bought a booth at the Republican State Convention this year. Um, and, and, you know, the, it, it, people were very upset, tried to get them thrown out. And um, to, to his credit, he came. Uh, and, and it was fascinating to watch mm. the stories. Like, people came very angry, like screaming. And uh, he would engage kindly. Um, he would he would ask he was used curiosity. He would ask them, "Tell me more about why you feel so strongly about this," um, and 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 truly wanted to know why do you feel this way, and and eventually they would say, "Well, I love my family, I, I love my country, and, and I feel like you know what you're doing is destroying it," and, and he would say things like, "I love my country too, and and I'm I, I'm glad you love your family. Tell me more about your family." Um, and, uh, and, then he's, and then after a while, he would say, well, can I tell you how I feel? And because he'd been so willing to listen, not just, not just listening to argue or debate, but truly interested, then they would say, sure, tell me how you feel. And one of the most extreme cases, at, at the end, he, he would always say, now I'm going to give you the last word. And uh, this, uh, this person, who was incredibly angry at the beginning, um, gave him a hug and apologized. So I, again, I, I don't... Look, I, and, and I, I can tell you stories the other way as, as well, okay, <laughs> where um, I've had people screaming at me for being a conservative, and, and, uh, um, but, um, but it, it's the only way I know to fix this. So, so you can complain and say, this isn't fair, you shouldn't ask me to have to do this. I'm like, keep doing it your way, and let's see how this ends. And, and um, it, it ends very badly for us. Well, so let, let's stay on LGBTQ issues for a okay. second, because... I think a lot of people in this room are nodding along to, to what you're saying, you know, about cooling the temperature and the culture wars and improving our political discourse. But where the rubber hits the road with this stuff is always when you get to an issue that people disagree about so profoundly that they, they don't see it, they see it as non-negotiable, right? And so, you know, to that end, let's talk about, for example, transgender health care. You signed a bill earlier this year that banned transgender uh, healthcare or certain forms of it, uh, gen so-called gender-affirming surgery, hormone therapy for people under 18 in Utah. Uh, you obviously received enormous backlash from the LGBTQ community in Utah and across the country. And I guess I wonder, how do you, you know, disagree better with people who say that you are trampling on their rights, that sure. you're treating them as, you know, inhuman. Like, how does, the, does this initiative hit a ceiling at some point where there are some issues where it just doesn't work? 
Well, look, I, I, I don't think it ever hits a ceiling where, where it doesn't work, but, but I understand the question. And this is, again, part of the criticism that we get the most often. By the way, the other criticism is you just want us to go along to get along. And again, I, I, I say that's not true. I want you to passionately argue for what you believe in, but, but, but attack ideas, not people. So but the, the other criticism is this. Look, um, some, some people think the disagree better means I get to win on every issue, right? And, and that's, that's just not true. That's not how it works in, in government or in a society. You win some, you lose some. Um, I, I do think there is an issue with trust being drained out of the system and trust in our, our institutions. We can talk about that later. But in, in this particular situation, so I get asked, you know, how did you do this? It looks like, you know, looks like the, the conservatives got their way and the, 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 um, the LGBTQ community, the, the, the transgender community, they just lost. And that's, that's certainly one way to look at it. Um, I, another way to look at it is um, I invited uh, transgender youth and their parents to the governor's mansion uh, along with uh, legislative leadership and the, the people who were running the bill um, before the legislative session started so that we could get to know each other, they could get to know each other as real human beings. Because I knew this was gonna come up, I knew it was probably gonna pass, uh, and uh, you know, I can talk about why I signed it. We, we, we don't have time to go there, but uh, this 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 night was really important, and and it changed a couple things that I I, I think matter. Um, one is it changed the tone of the debate. Um, if you look at the debate in other states on this issue across the country. Um, some of the things that were said are just terrible, just, just awful. Um, and, and there was a little bit of that here, but, but mostly it was respectful. And, and I, I think that matters. You may think that's a distinction without a difference. I think it matters. Um, there were some changes in the bill that I think mattered. Um, it went from a complete ban to a pause where we're, we're going to get more science, more research, more information um, down the road. And, and I, I, I think that matters. Again, it's, it, the, the end effect is the same, but I, I think that matters. Uh, it, we, uh, we added um, a, a million dollars uh, to organizations that give free therapy to transgender gender youth. Again, in a, in a, in a in a super conservative state uh, with a super majority Republicans, they set aside money to help, help transgender youth. Uh, and, and then the, for those who were already going through those processes and already on those medications, they allowed that to continue, which didn't happen in many other states. So those were three changes that happened to the bill, I think because we had this moment where we came together, even though we disagreed passionately. Um, the last thing I want to say is, and this got no attention, again, in a super, uh, a super conservative majority uh, uh, legislature, we, we passed a, uh, a bill um, that, uh, that, that ended or, or banned conversion therapy, and it passed unanimously. And, and this was the same legislature, and that, that got no attention. We had a signing ceremony, again, with Equality Utah and the Eagle Forum, um, and the two most conservative. By the way, that bill started out um, as, as a bill to reinstate conversion therapy. Um, and, and because they sat down together in a room for weeks and negotiated in good faith and, and didn't blow each other up in the media, didn't try to tear each other down. They came to that conclusion. So, so again, again, if, 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 you, if, if, you're, if you have a transgender youth, you, you might be really angry at us right now. Um, and some, some people did move out of our state, and, and I, I, I feel terrible that they felt like they had to do that. So I'm not saying you shouldn't be angry, or that you shouldn't be upset, or that you shouldn't be passionate and disagree, but I am saying that because we were able to engage in good faith, um, some, some different things happen. And again, traditionally, that's what we've done as a country, but the, the last 10 years, we're not doing any of that. I want, in the last few minutes we have, to talk about uh, another driving force in our polarization is social media. Yeah. And Utah has taken uh, a, a kind of distinctive approach to social media, uh, big tech, particularly when it pertains to teens. Um, you, uh, let me make sure I get the details right, but you recently passed legislation that would prohibit people under 18 from having social media accounts without parents' consent, that would enforce a statewide social media curfew for kids, and that would give parents access to their kids' private messages. 
what what was the thinking there? What problem were you trying to address, and how has it worked so far? Yeah. Well, so I'll answer the second question first. So we, we have a, a, a year-long implementation. So it, it actually hasn't started yet, and uh, we're working with tech companies to uh, to to implement the kind of. And there's also they some be. litigation. There's some lawsuits. litigation that that is are happening in other parts of the country that we're watching very closely in Arkansas, who followed us, Texas as as well. Um, but but look, the, the the problem here that that we've seen again that experts have seen um, the. Uh, uh, the, the rates, especially amongst youth, of anxiety, depression, and self-harm, uh, suicide, starting in about 2011, 2012, have just skyrocketed. Again, the data is very clear. And, and more and more research is showing not just a correlation, but, but a, a causal link between uh, an increased use of social media and, uh, and a degradation in, in mental health with our, our young people. And, and that's what we're trying to get at. Um, that's what we're trying to solve. Uh, the most addictive features of the social media media uh, companies that they put into place, um, trying to remove those from kids' accounts. It's bad, I mean, Let's be let's be honest. It's 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 screwing all of us up. I, I mean, adults too. But um, we, it's much more dangerous with youth, especially those going through puberty. Uh, again, the research is is more clear all the time. And so that's what we're trying to solve. We're not trying to tell parents how to how to parent. We're trying to give parents and families the tools that they need. Um, I will also say that um, despite you know I'm like wow, you passed some controversial legislation this year on social media. It's the least controversial legislation we've ever passed. 85% of Utahns um, support it, um, and uh, like 10% don't know, and the other five are opposed to it. It's, it's that small. Uh, Republicans and Democrats across the country have reached out to us, including Congress. Uh, Pre President Biden, when he came to Utah a few weeks ago, it's the very first thing he wanted to talk about. Um, said he was grateful we were able to get it done, and he's hoping to get that done at, at the congressional level as well. So uh, so, so we, we can do more. I, I, I truly believe that, I, I mean, I do now, but that as a society, we will look back on the way we gave unfettered access to social media to our kids the same way we look at like cigarettes in the in the 50s and 60s and opioids, you know, 10 years ago, uh, that it caused immense damage and uh, that we were we were blind to it. And, and by the way, that social media companies knew and covered it up just like cigarette companies and opioid companies. Not not, not to step on the applause here, but you are a, a pretty well-known Twitter addict. I, I yes. Should, I feel like that's a, you need to disclose that for the, the yeah. group here, we, as am I. We I do. Uh, in fact, I think that's how we met uh, the first time, <laughs> was, was via, via Twitter. Uh, and, and so I will say, speaking as an addict, I have deep <laughs> insight into how dangerous these tools can be. It's, by the way, I don't know if you've heard, it's X now. It's I, X, it's, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies to Elon, wherever he is. Hey, is, um, he, is he not after me? <laughs> yeah, he, we'll see. Maybe a special guest appearance. Um, <laughs> so uh, I guess the last question I want to ask you is, you know, there's no getting around the fact that as you are working to improve the political discourse and the political culture in this country, you belong to a party that's led by a man who... Uh, his entire persona is sort of anathema to this project, right? Um, you know, we're ha you, you mentioned we're probably heading into another extremely ugly, extremely divisive uh, campaign season. Um, first, I, I, I should get you on record, do you want Donald Trump to be your party's nominee next year? And then the follow-up to that is, if he is, um, what is what is that going to do to this this initiative? Sure. Um, so so I, I know we're winding up. Thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate this. Um, I, I can just see your bosses are like, oh no, Mitt Romney's retiring. We got to find another Mormon to get on stage with. <laughs> and this here guy. we go. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, no, no. I, Does that mean you're running for Senate? No, no. Can I get not, you on the I'm record? Not, I'm not running for anything. No, I, I, should, I should say member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yes, but well, it steps on the joke. It uh, does. It, so, I know. Um, it's a whole thing with our style guide at the Atlantic. I know, We're working with I know. the copy it's, editors on it. I'm we're sorry. working on that. Um, look, uh, uh, so, so so the answer is uh, no. I, I would love someone else. I'm a big fan of governors. I think governors make good presidents, and we have uh, lots of wonderful governors that are running for office. So I, I would love to see someone else. Um, I, I, I I think just look. I, this is really important to all of us. Right now, um, uh, some recent polling that showed that 70% of Republicans don't want um, Donald Trump to, to actually run. 
and 75% uh, of Democrats don't want Joe Biden to run. Uh, we have a super majority of our nation doesn't want either of them to run. <laughs> And yet, and yet, they're both probably going to be the nominees. Um, so that, that talks about our system and how messed up it is, another, an, another uh, story for another time. But I, I think the, the point here that is really important is that the fact that, that they are means that this work is more important than ever before, um, that we, we, we desperately need more of this. Again, that Overton window, the, the fact that we're numb to some of the things that are said, um, some of the actions that are taken, um, j just reiterates, and, and, and it, we can't can't expect politicians to save this. It, it is every single one of us engaged in this work. In a very real way, what you post on Facebook um, is doing as much damage to our country and, and to our world, to global security, by the way. I, I mean, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, they love this stuff. They love the way we're tearing each other apart. Um, and, and the world needs a, a, a strong and unified America more than ever before. Um, and so I, I would just encourage all of us to think twice. Anytime you're saying those Republicans or those Democrats, um, those people, then you're doing it wrong and you're hurting, you're hurting our country. There is nothing more un-American than hating our fellow Americans. And it's up to all of us to change DC, not the other way around. So, so please, please, please think twice and, uh, and, and reach out to people who are different than you. Governor Cox, thank you very much. Thank you.